right, lights are hot. Um, hey, <laughs> good sound. Straight up at nine o'clock. Sure she's by the microphone. Some people behind me always makes me feel a little. <laughs> uh, welcome, um, everyone. We're grateful to be able to get together um, during the spring um, meeting. Seems like the last time we met, we made some jokes about someday it's going to be warm and we're still right there. Um, Kim, would you go ahead and put the first slide up? Just trying to get people linked into the mirror. As, uh, as you're joining, and as we get the meeting started, I've been told that there are some access challenges right now for some of you ac uh, getting into the PowerPoint slides. Amy is working on that. We'll have that resolved um, shortly. Yes, Kim. And, and Darren, we have uh, two um, slides. Um, we are doing a poll about some access, and we're also going to be talking about alert paper procedures today. We really need everyone to log into the into the power, into the Nearpod, Nearpod today. We need responses so okay i'm assuming everyone was able to hear that just another plea for you to join the nearpod so that we can uh, collect uh, feedback for you in two specific parts uh, during our presentation today um, this quote comes from um obviously stephen covey is identified on there but our team a couple of years ago engaged in a professional learning experience called leading at the speed of trust um, and i found that to be very enjoyable and uh, very helpful and uh, over the last month, um, I've had the opportunity to watch uh, an organization uh, with group leadership that oversees uh, a lot of people. And um, I've watched them struggle to be able to accomplish work um, that seems to be pretty simple and basic, but it's difficult for them to move forward. And as I've watched that, I've reflected back on uh, this uh, comment from Stephen Covey and the work we did in trying to build our capacity to build trust within our, our team here, within assessment accountability. And as it became clear to me that one of the challenges that organization is facing, their ability to move forward and accomplish uh, the work that they want to is just a lack of trust that they have within, um, within their team. And um, so I brought this back up. Um, just a reflection, if you're in organizations uh, or on teams where it feels like it's difficult to move forward, uh, to get things accomplished, um, I think uh, the first thing to look at would be the level of trust that you have within your team. And if that's low, then I um, encourage you to take steps to try to, to rectify that and build uh, more trust. Um, my first slide is an update on the board meeting as we go into uh, the month of May. Um, I've made a commitment to you that we'll try to do a better job of communicating items that you might be interested in following with our board. Um, so with, um, I think it was Senate Bill 308, which removed the requirement to for the state board to publish an overall school grader rating. There are several rules that need to be updated. Um, two of those are listed here for the May meeting. Uh, these two will go through the lawn licensing committee. Uh, you might ask, why would they go lawn licensing? Um, the Standards Assessment Committee has a lengthy set of uh, core standards and um, course standards that they are in the process of reviewing and, and amending and, uh, and adopting. In fact, there's a special meeting coming up. Um, I don't remember the day that it is. I think it's uh, next Tuesday, maybe. Um, they've scheduled uh, six to eight hours to accomplish that work. Um, so these two, these two rules um, are right now scheduled to go through lawn licensing, um, barring a change by board leadership of reassigning those. So if you're interested, you can follow that. The 920 is what previously a lot of us would know um, in a legacy term as the school turnaround provision, which references um, overall school grades and ratings and closing the gap by one third. We were meeting on that earlier this morning with our policy team. You'll see there are the future items that aren't scheduled yet. There's just such a large amount of work um, that needs to go before the board, and we try to prioritize those that are the most uh, time sensitive. Um, uh, some of these will come up in the future. TSSA um, also references um, accountability in relationship to an overall school grade. So we're making, um, having the board or directing the board in their efforts to make corrections to that. Acadians Mathematics. Amendments. Um, I think Sid, when she joins us later today, can talk about some of the work we're trying to do with that uh, vendor to make that system more um, beneficial or easier to use for your teachers. Um, we have the, um, the Utah Consolidated Application 95% Participation Amendment. That also comes out of the legislative process. I don't remember the bill number, but they require the, in that bill it requires the State Board of Education to submit request a waiver 
on the 95% requirement. Um, fortunately, from our, my perspective, um, we've already submitted a request for that back in 2018. It was de uh, denied. Other states have submitted requests for waivers on 95% waiver. They've all been denied. So I put this up here just so you can know uh, and you'll see this. Um, I don't know that it will bring about any meaningful uh, changes in your world, but um, we'll go forward with that in the coming months. And then the Acadians reading, and I had on here Acadians reading a mathematics contract. We've been talking internally about trying to bring those two contracts together. Um, this uh, statement's uh, no longer accurate over the last several days. And we'll be moving forward with just the Acadians reading uh, contract. That expires in the spring of 2024. Um, and so we're well out in front of this um, and we're working to release that RFP. Um, and then the math, the mathematics um, contract um, is good through the following year. I think spring of, what's that? 26. So that contract's in place through 2026. Um, we'll be taking some um, efforts internally, uh, encouraging our board to work with the legislature to bring the two funding streams, uh, the one for Acadians Mathematics and the one for Acadians Reading together, which would allow us to better facilitate putting the contracts together and increasing the potential that LEs might only deal with a single vendor in the future, um, or some of you do right now. But um, anyway, I'm going to pause there to see if there are any questions for me about upcoming board meeting issues. Um, oh, the next slide actually is APAC. I've still got that one. So our Assessment Accountability Policy Advisory Committee, which is, is does have two assessment directors represent that uh, board's formal committee. We're scheduled to meet May 11th. Um, I've just included in here um, high-level uh, agenda items that we'll be talking about. That committee will review the proposed changes uh, to those three policies related to 308. Um, the standards for K-12 ELA were adopted at our most recent board meeting, which is something we've been anticipating and excited to see that go forward. We'll begin working with our vendors on the timeline and action steps related to um, new blueprint designs, uh, new item development, um, and then being able to lay out a timeline and implementing those. So we'll have more information to come um, in our meetings, obviously over the next couple of years around that, but um, we'll begin that discussion with APAC. And then the, uh, we'll discuss the benchmark uh, assessment RFP uh, that I mentioned earlier. So let me pause there and see if there are any questions for me about um, the items that I've talked about. And Emily's given me the nod that there are no questions this time. So I'm going to sit down and Kim, I think you're next. Is that correct? Everybody hear me if I stay here? Okay. All right. Uh, we, we have a couple of things we're going to talk about today. And one of the things that um, we wanted to provide some clarification about is alert papers. Um, not everyone gets them, fortunately. Um, but for those of for those of you who do, I've had some questions about what exactly triggers an alert paper, what are the policies that happen with, the, with alert papers, and so I wanted you to be aware that um, the majority of the alert papers we get are from Cambian for the RISE test, um, and some people thought that um, they only get them if the students are completing writing tests or, or uh, completing short answers, but that is not true. It actually um, alerts from the global notes, so if students click on the note the notes in the in any of the assessments um, when they're typing things, it will trigger alerts for that. Um, also, DRC um, that we received. In fact, this year we had a couple. We get them also for the WIDA for WIDA access as well. Um, and we handle we we handle these exactly the same procedure. Um, we notify you um, and do certain things. But I wanted to let you know exactly what it is that shows up. It is an AI algorithm that um, sends the alert, and both systems basically work the same. But what the categories trigger are basically harm to self harm to another, harm from someone else, severe depression or tra and or trauma, and, and specific and serious re uh, requests for help. So anything that a student's typing in there, and we see lots of them like, I hate this test, kill me now, that will automatically trigger every single time, okay? So what we're gonna talk about today is, is how 
you know, what is the actual procedure? And I wanted you to be aware. And we talked about this before, but I wanted to just explain to you what the USBE um, procedure is for alert papers. Um, Emily Ng and myself are the only two people who, who handle the alert papers um, because of the sensitive nature of it. It's also the most depressing part of our job. This year we've hit, right now we're at about, I, I thought it was 160, it's about 100, 116 this year already. And we just opened the summative window. Get about an average of about five a day, depending on the day. Um, and we are notified usually from CAI now about twice a day with them. We'll get, we usually get some around 11 o'clock in the morning. And then they try to notify us before around 2.30 if we have any. So you need to be aware that we do get them on Friday afternoons, which we know is really stressful for everyone. But we want to talk about that policy. So what happens is we get them, they're notified to us via a secure link. I send the email, high importance email notification immediately to the LEA assessment director. That's who gets these. Um, Emily places the file into move it. And she also notifies you that the file has been updated, uh, has been uploaded. Um, it's expected that you guys review and respond to the email and the file notification within 24 hours. Even if you're, if you have to forward it on to someone, you need to let us know that you've received it and you're working on it. But then after that time, I need a confirmation email after that, that the school has completed whatever appropriate procedure based on the alert contact has been handled. And I get varying levels of information back from people. Just saying it's been forwarded to the school counselors is not enough information. I need confirmation that says the alert has been, you know, that the student and parents were notified if it's appropriate, because there are sometimes, um, according to DCFS rules, where parents may be, um, it may be a situation, sadly, where the student may be being abused. And so that's one of those things you have to, you know, you have to determine from a local level. Um, we know that some of these are not always, you know, and in fact, the majority of them are not serious situations. Um, but, you know, you don't want to be the one the one school with the one student that it is a serious situation. And we've had some pretty serious ones. When I review every single one, when I receive the ones that have particularly egregious or frightening or scary or um, dangerous seeming alerts, I will send you a special email and let you know about those. Um, I try to call you. And so we are using the phone number that's on our, eight, um, our directors list. Unfortunately, sometimes, you know, you're not there. So we're going to talk about this procedure right now. Okay, and I figured Hal was going to want to say something because I asked Hang him to join. Mics. Can I ask it now, Kim? Yeah, go ahead. Emily so, just unmuted you. Because I, I guess I'm, I want to just verify. So you need within 24 hours a generic response to say we're trying to contact we're in the process of contacting the school and the necessary party. And then yes. once you get verification from the schools, once we get verification from the school that the parent or student's been contacted, then you need a second confirmation from us. So you need yes. two, is that right? Yeah, or sometimes it happens with that. I mean, I don't have to have two emails. Like for example, you know, like with you, you text the principals, they may get right back to you and you already know that the principals made contact. If you email me, that can be one confirmation email. When I need two of them is if it's going to take some time, you know, it's going to take you more than a day or two. Um, you've reached out and called, okay. you know, you've had to call the principal, something like that, where it's going to be a slightly delayed. And, and, and by the way, you don't have to do, you know, like on Friday afternoons, if you're reaching out to the principal, I'm going to assume that sometime over the weekend, something's happening. And then Monday, you can tell me if it's happening. But what I'm starting to find is I'm getting some that are now, I don't get any confirmation email that anything's happening and it's seven, 10 days. And so I am sending multiple reminders now. And that's one of the reasons why, if that helps. Okay. Cause I, I tell my schools that I, I, it's strongly recommended that they get back to me within 24 hours but they're required within 48 hours to get back to me that that they've done that. Is that okay within your policy? Yeah, that would be fine. And in fact, the next slide, we're gonna, this Thanks. is the reason why we've asked everyone to join us on, on Nearpod because we really wanna have a discussion about 
what everyone's doing. So we have a pretty consistent policy. This is, by the way, the law. This is not, um, this is through legislation. I can give you the rules. I've already given it to you in previous AD meetings with the rules about notification, um, where you think that student's in danger. And it's the exact same criteria in the law that is in the alerts. So it's really important that everybody understands that, you know, what, even if you think, oh, they're just typing song lyrics, it's great. You know, like um, sometimes it's okay for a principal to call the student down and just say, hey, I noticed you type these, you know, because why is that student particularly typing disturbing content song lyrics in their, their, um, in their uh, papers and things like that. So that's one of the things. And sometimes it's just nice for them to be able to see and talk to somebody um, that they don't always get to talk to. And we have, you know, we have had reports of that sometimes they are not, they were not in the radar of the school to, um, that this child really was having issues. And that's the first call for help that a student actually did. Um, Cal, you and I, when we talked about this, you kind of view these in your district as kind of the same thing as the Safe UT app. I, I so, don't see, I don't see any difference from really the Safe UT app. Um, ultimately, because I just don't know. That kind of freaks me out. I would never wait six or seven days because, um, I mean, like you said, you could have thirty of them, and one of them may be of an important nature. And I have told my schools that we treat everything the same and that they treat everything the same because we just don't want to be, I don't want to make a decision about the validity or the veracity of what they're trying to say or not say, even though it looks fairly innocent. And I haven't heard any pushback from my schools. We, we say they're all taken seriously. Here's your timeline and get back to me. And I, I just wouldn't be comfortable thinking differently. Thanks. Thanks, Al. So my mouse is not working today, guys. So I'm sorry. Have a collaboration board. And what I'd like you to do is share in the collaboration board what is your procedure for alert papers. And for those of you who've never had any, this, this is a really valuable thing for you to watch because it may give you some guidelines because this is part of the required school safety um, legislation. Um, so what is the expectation for administrator response to the alert and provider welfare check? What communication plan do you have in place that doesn't create a a barrier when contacting the appropriate school administrator, you know, because sometimes they're at a soccer game and you have to text them and they may not have access to the file, but you need to have some way to communicate with them so they know exactly what it is. We had one um, last week where I needed to, you know, because uh, Emily was actually out of the office when we got it. And so when I contacted the assessment director, I said, call me and I can tell you and read you the alert paper over the phone so that they were aware of what the content was before the file got to them. And we were able to, to that situation very quickly. So if you guys go ahead and, and add your comments, that would be awesome. There was a question put in the chat. Sure. It was sent directly to me, but uh, how do we confirm who in our LEA will be receiving these emails? It's the, you get them from the assessment. I send them to the designated LEA assessment director on our director's list. So that is who gets them. So. And by the way, if the procedures that you see somebody typing in, you're welcome to, to you know, part them if it's, you know, you, some of you guys are typing the same, so it's awesome.
that is some people actually even follow up with text to administrators. Um, um, parents are generally or almost always included in these, and that's really important as well, um, as well as, you know, checking in with the student as well. Remember, you know the students and you know the situations with families more than we do. But the reason why the urgency for this is, is because we are also, I mean, Emily and I are also held to the same DCFS um, re reporting rules as you are, but because we um, do not are, and are not aware of family situations or students have to depend on you to handle these. Um, and uh, our, you know, assistant AG, Brian Creasonberry said, as long as we have a set procedure and we're doing things then we're, we're fine. So we just wanted to verify that everyone has the same procedure or that people have similar procedures. And I will um, go through these after the meeting, um, probably in the next AD meeting or so, I will be sharing you know, the general response so that everybody can see these for if anybody's really is out and says, hey, how is that working? So this is really good. Thank you very much for, for sharing that. Can respond? There's a question on the gym. I can't. It's here, let me read it. Brand new to this position, how do you receive the students' information website? Oh, the student, oh, oh, Wendy, I can tell you that. Sorry, I sorry, I said your name. Um, <laughs> um, the How you get the information is we sent you an email. I said, uh, I, you will get an e a high alert email from me. And then um, Emily will also email you with your, um, with your move, with the access, she will upload the file into move it and she sends you an email. Then you click in your move it file and find it, and then you reach out and contact. Um, and if you don't have access to move it, you need to reach out to Emily. Since you're brand new, you may not. So find out, and and that's one of the things. But that's how you receive it. It's um, and how I receive the the student information. It comes directly from the assessment vendors for by what students have typed in um, the on their test somewhere on their test. Um, and we do not want people to discourage kids don't like, did, you'll notice there is nothing in the scripting instructions for any test administration manual that says, don't mess around and type messages to people in the chats and things like that, because we don't want to close off that communication with students. It may be their only contact. And, and Jim? Yeah. Can I, um, can I make a request to try to, depending on the district and their situation, is there a way that you could complete a form or create a simple form that will allow us as the district assessment director to submit that a second backup person receives the information so we can have another set of hands to make sure this occurs in a timely way? Would you at least think about that idea that there's a backup so it doesn't reside on one person at a district or a charter? Um, I would have appreciate that and then it's not recommended but i i have stepped in in the past and i know a few colleagues as well who have made that welfare check because they haven't been able to get somebody to respond at the school and i just wanted to see if your policy will address that as either required or recommended but um sure. if the timing isn't right i've just stepped in and contacted the parent i did that on a friday because i didn't want the full weekend to go thanks we can what we may be able to do is have everyone when you submit your information for you you just need to send me an email i get we can create a form i guess we can fill it out but what we'll, we'll put on our directors list is there'll be a special designation assessment directors will always get these no matter what and then whoever you designate as the secondary person We'll actually put in parentheses on the director's list, and I'm saying this for everybody on staff too, if they're looking, that says alert, um, so that you're aware that that person probably, you know, that, that as long as they're aware, and it will be the responsibility of the LEAs to keep that list updated, because, you know, we always ask you guys to continually keep us, and, and also make sure that they have access to move it, so they'll be, well, Emily and I will work on this later, at later probably tomorrow. Well, thanks, Hal. That's a good suggestion. Okay, we can move on from there. The next thing, language translation, translation for summative assessments. And we apologize. Normally, we do not launch new things when we don't have a chance to talk about it. But under the circuit, we got um, 
the Spanish adaptive finally started working for RISE and we didn't have time to go through all of the things. And once we sat down and looked at it, we thought we need to have a very clear policy for who um, qualifies for Spanish adaptive as well as for students who don't speak Spanish and also qualify for language translation. So we just wanted to remind you that there is guidance for that. Um, it needs to meet all of the criteria that's in here, at least one. It is based on WIDA, WIDA access or screener scores. Um, they need to be receiving some kind of classroom instructional support in their uh, primary language um, that allows them to access the content that's going to be assessed. And what that basically means, you guys, is that if a student has, has not received any sort of um, access to content in their language at all, and then you want to give them a translated test, how do you know they've learned anything because they've never received any sort of instruction or any kind of guidance? And we're not saying you teach them in their primary language. We're saying they get some support so that you're aware that they're actually learning um, the content that they're then going to be assessed for in the target language as well, because it's basically like they haven't learned anything and now you're going to give them assessment with a, with a translator. It's not going to be any easier or it could be even more frustrating because they're going to out on something. Um, the other consideration that's very important with this is um, don't just automatically assume because a student speaks another language fluently that they can read academic language in their primary language. That's a very important consideration, particularly when we're talking about RISE third and fourth and fifth graders. Um, you know, not all students who speak the language read the language fluently enough to be able to complete a test. And it may be simpler for them to take it in English, depending on what, you know, or be able to toggle back and forth with RISE. So that would be one of the things. The, and then, of, of course, we talk about how long the student has been in, in, in the United States and all of that. The form that we have you fill out, form, we do not need you to turn in the adaptive translation request form for Spanish because they are in, in both, uh, Spanish is embedded both in RISE and in Utah Aspire Plus. If, but if they do require the test administration script to be read in Spanish, they need to be tested in a separate location. You can have all the students who require the Spanish scripting and assistance in total Spanish. Like if they have a question to be spoken with to them in Spanish, put them in a separate, test them together. Do not put them in the class with all of the students who speak English because when you read the scripts, which are required, the students speaking English will have to listen to the English scripts. Then they have to sit and wait for the Spanish scripts. It can really slow down your testing. There's a question. Go ahead, Emily. Uh, Hal has his hand up. Okay, Hal. Um, I know it's all these topics, but I do I do need to see it. I'm just going to speak for myself, and that is, um, there's so many unintended consequences that that the Spanish transadaptive is created that I don't know what to do, and I know this is out there and recorded, but in my diverse schools, it's in before it was always everyone has their similar approach to trying to access English. We're doing our accommodations. We're bringing it along. But by creating this new category of a Spanish form, it hasn't put everyone on the same level that there's an, now an afforded access thing for another group of students. And there's a lot of unintended consequence of, well, it's for this group, but not for this group. And um, it's been tricky conversations to try to to get back to it. And I kind of, I don't know, it, it's not been easy conversations. Um, it, it sounded good at the start, but when it's played out for my schools, it's been really, really hard to try to send a message that this one group has this access but a bunch of the more rarer languages don't. And so it feels more like winners and losers at times. It's been tricky for my diverse schools to implement this. I want to echo that too. This is Joan from Granite. And I am really struggling with this um, from an equity lens. There are real issues um, when you're allowing this and a different set of rules 
if I'm a Spanish speaker versus all of the other language, languages that are spoken in our district is created a, a, a huge problem. I pre appreciate you sharing your experiences in the field. Uh, I think it's important to understand why Spanish, why the State Board of Education chose or selected Spanish, in addition to English, as being available in students. That really boils down to the percentage of students in the state, and I realize this is different, that you have, many of you have schools that you have um, high percentages of other languages being spoken that exceeds 5%. But as, as the State Board of Education uh, continues to try to expand access, so in this case, if it sounds like from your description, it feels like uh, from many people's perspective, it's creating um, inequity issues. In relationship to the board's position, because we have five greater than 5% of our students that speak Spanish, in the state of Utah. That's why that language has been selected as a starting point for providing access in a student's native other than English. Remembering that there's um, always been a discrepancy between students who speak English as their native language. I understand. I, I wish the, the subcommittee would have had a hearing about it and let some people speak about this issue because it, in paper, it looks one way, but when you're trying to talk to a diverse group of educators, it's just hard to, it It looks like people are different groups and tiers rather than trying to say we're, it's just been really hard. I don't, I don't know. I'm glad that my colleagues are echoing this. I, it's a good idea on paper, but I wish there'd be some hearings about it or ways to give input that doesn't look like we're trying to be problems to the system. I The concept's good, but it's hard for other language services to hear this message. So we'll, have, we'll have Megan follow up on it as I finish my comments. So I'll just uh, thank you, Hal and Joan, for sharing the experiences that you're having in your LEA. Yeah, and I would I would encourage LEAs to reach out to myself, Megan Lopez, and, and Michelle Neal. We are happy to engage in conversations with your um, language services departments as well. But really, um, the driving force behind this is it is federal law, um, and it it's part of ESSA. So we have to um, provide based on a certain percentage. USBE has to provide translated assessments um, for students, you know, and it has to be for the, yes, entire population of Utah, which we do see, um, you know, that's where the big concern comes from because Spanish is the only one that actually per um, our ESSA plan meets that threshold. Um, but we recognize that it's not equitable to only provide for Spanish when we have so many other languages represented in Utah. Um, and that's why we are trying to make this effort to, to try to make as um, equitable and even a playing field. It's not perfect and we're still working through it. And we would we would love feedback. Um, and and I have I've had the opportunity to speak with several of you about this, but um, it, it really is not a choice because it is federal law. So, um, I, I mean, I, I would say whatever thoughts you have on how can we make this better um, and what tweaks can we make to these language translations for summative assessments, um, knowing that there are stipulations from federal law that we have to adhere to. Um, what what can we do though um, on the USBE side to make this a little bit better? Because we we definitely are trying to give everyone equitable access, no matter their target language, right? Um, you know, it, it's not it's not the best response I can give right now, but it's a response. Um, 
that we are open to feedback and, and learning along with you as we, as we go through this. Um, let, let's just be, you know, collaborative partners um, moving forward. Um, let us know the pain points that you're encountering. Um, part of also ESSA, just so you know, is that um, while the state has to provide, you know, based on that percentage threshold translations, ESSA also is very clear in stating that um, the LEAs, it is the responsibility of LEAs to provide this, um, you know, for, for uh, students that don't meet that threshold, and we want to support you the best we can in meeting those requirements as well. Al, I see your hand went up. This is going to say, listen to you talk, and I think about um, how one of your about, um, and I think I'm from committee. Darren, stand under the Oh, am I being too quiet? You're getting too quiet. I'm the only one. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, I listened to Megan, you talk, and how your comment about you wish it come before a committee. We, as we move forward, um, it sounds like one thing we could do is the staff here at the state board. Like to work on this or, or um, further discussions and determine whether there's additional actions that we could recommend the state board take. That's something that we could uh, certainly manage within our own department. But I'll go ahead. I'd say your hand up. Well, it, is, it, it hit late in the year for the magnitude of what this involves. I mean, I, I needed months to try to get people comfortable. I, it just brings up a lot of issues of why this group, why not that group, what we're here to do this, but the timeline was also really crummy. I mean, I just, I would have, I don't know why I wasn't paying attention of you messaging in October that this is coming and start working on your policy and procedures. I, I just, I got, it was late for me to do some stuff. And in fact, I did see that the test administration manual changed after I printed out a hundred copies of RISE and sent it out to everybody. And then they posted an update that had all this Spanish, Spanish stuff dropped in. It, the timing was crummy too, quite honestly. And when you say you're not sure why you didn't catch it earlier, I feel I feel the same way individually, personally. Um, and I think for me, as I think about it, you know, the UA Plus has had the Spanish Transadaptive since 2009. Uh, Am I correct? Uh -huh. And so, from my perspective, I didn't flag it as big of an issue as I probably should have. We hadn't heard from the field challenges with this Aspire Plus Spanish Transadaptive like we are now with the rise. Option is available. Bob, I'm with you, Holly. I, I, uh, I feel the same way that I should have caught. Personally, I should have caught that earlier. We could have begun a discussion. Making some assumptions that uh, the application of Spanish transaction was being taken at the Utah Spire Plus test for grades 9 and 10, and that. Um, uh, that hadn't created um, challenges like you're describing that application. And so it, it caught me off guard as well. Can I address DLM with this really quickly? Can you hear me? <laughs> this, is, this is Tracy. So I've had a lot of questions um, uh, come about how does this apply with DLM? So what we do with DLM is we we try to fall in line with what goes on with RISE or Utah Spire Plus. So since 2019, um, teams have been able to um, translate DLM for that 910. Um, and so then now that we've brought on 38 uh, in math and science, teams can go ahead for DLM and they can translate that. It's all outside of the system. DLM doesn't have any embedded supports. Um, so I took a phone call a couple weeks ago from a teacher asking about it and, and how to know if it would be appropriate. And so I asked her, I said, well, how are you doing any sort of translation for this kiddo instructionally? Oh, my para is a fluent speaker and the student, when she needs something translated, translate it. And I was like, there you go. There's a perfect example of where it would be appropriate. The para just joins, right? The testing, if the student needs 
a word or something translated, then they go ahead and do that. So it is, it's allowable. We, we kind of do that sort of try to stay in a line with DLM as much as what goes on with the regular assessments. So does that help with DLM? And I know some of you online have emailed me and I have not responded yet. So here's your response. <laughs> does that make sense? Okay, uh, real quick, uh, the uh, standard test administration testing and policy training has been updated. We are trying to get it uh, um, posted on the USBE website. It should be there within the next week, hopefully. Um, and we will be providing the new link for you so that you have it for next year. The one thing that um, I'm requesting is that for those of you who are putting the training into your Canvas courses for your local districts, Please don't edit the content very much because um, every one of the, the eight scenarios that you'll see now in the testing ethics policy are coming directly from questions that we consistently receive from teachers, from you, from other from principals in your LEAs, or they are situations that we have observed when we've been doing assessment observations over the last five years. So those are really important conversations that need to be had with teachers. Um, as well as some of the other testing ethics situations. And so you'll see those um, provide you the links to the ethics policy. We provide you the links to the legislation. So please make sure when you're, when you know, you're using, if you're, for those of you who are uploading it and using it differently, make sure that when you upload it for next year, that you take that into account because we want to make sure that everyone's aware that these are actual situations. Um, I was going to um, go in and, and kind of show you some of it, but we've had a lot of discussion today, so I think we'll, we'll just go ahead and move on. But you will be able to look at it. If anybody has any questions about it once it gets posted, and I will put the link in the AD memo next week. We're just waiting for um, our webmaster left, so we're we're kind of in a we're in a queue. So we're kind of waiting for the queue to to get to the top, and then once we get that ready, then we'll let you know. So if anybody has any questions about that, please feel free to reach out and email me. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about that. Now we're to Maureen. All right. So um, we're right in the thick of the spring summative testing window. So I thought I'd give you guys just a quick update on rostering. Um, first of all, any changes? If you're not seeing a student roster and you've made changes recently in your SIS to any of that student information or or enrollment or courses, um, you'll probably need to wait about 24 to 48 hours for them to make it all the way through to your uh, assessments. Um, your SIS sends information to Utrex. If that, if that information is error free, it has to update in all of our in all of our tables. And then the assessment comes and takes the student information. Sometimes that lines up and the student gets straight into an assessment. Sometimes the timing is off and you're going to have to wait a day or so for that uh, updated information to sh make it all the way to your assessments. Uh, also, let's say you change uh, some teacher information in an assessment. Let's say in, in RISE, a teacher doesn't have their cactus ID in there and so they aren't seeing rosters. If you add that cactus ID in, it's going to you're going to have to wait for the nightly upload for those rosters to show up for that teacher. So uh, if you're seeing rostering issues in RISE, here's some likely suspects. Um, fatal Utrex errors. Students with fatal errors, that rostering information is not going to update. So um, you can check in the data gateway under your Utrex. Oh my gosh, it just left me what it's called. <laughs> anyway, check for your Utrex errors in, in the data gateway. In the data gateway. <laughs> Validations? No, it's a, the, the name of the page escapes me, but if you check for errors, you know right where it is. <laughs> Sorry. This could be a fun game. It's <laughs> in <laughs> the page. Um, uh, also, make sure that 1% flag is not marked for a student. They are not going to roster for RISE if the 1% flag is marked. Utrex overview? Utrex overview. Megan wins. No, no. Brandon wins. Oh, Brandon wins. <laughs> it's the Utrex overview page. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, so if 1% is marked for a student, they are not going to go into RISE. And remember that new validation that came down. It's a warning. If you have students enrolled in essential elements courses that are supposed to be in RISE, they will not get assigned a test. They have to be enrolled in a RISE triggering course. So remember that one. Yes, and that goes with our, our core code priority logic. Uh, essential elements courses do not have core codes that will roster a student into a test. Um, if a student is rostered in more than one course that will trigger a test, the higher priority um, the course will roster. Um, if we have further on in resources, I have a link to that page that shows all the core course courses that will cause a student to, to uh, roster for RISE. Also, make sure your course entry and exit dates um, are accurate. If a student has an entry date to a course that's today, probably not going to see them in RISE until tomorrow. <coughs> um, also, make sure your course entry and exit dates are within a student's school exit and entry date. If they are exiting out of a course the day after you have them exiting school, probably not going to roster or RISE. Same if they are entering a course before you have them entering school, not going to roster for RISE. All right, so Utah Aspire Plus is slightly different. It's just based on ninth and 10th grade. Uh, we don't really look at course enrollments. So same thing, check for those fatal Utrex errors on the Utrex overview page. Um, also same 1%, if 1% is marked, they are not going to roster for Utah Aspire Plus. Also, same thing, look at those, in this case, school entry and exit dates. If they just entered school today, probably not going to see them in Spire Plus until tomorrow. Um, if a student is enrolled in more than one school, there's a series of tiebreakers, which will determine which school a student will roster for. Um, the, uh, those tiebreakers are located in the, the uh, student rostering manual. I have a link to that a little later on in resources, so you can look there. Oh, one more thing. If you see sort of the opposite problem, if you have students that are rostered in courses in a test they shouldn't be rostered in, maybe the wrong grade, the, the wrong test, please let me know. Um, we need to get that fixed. Um, it's important to get that fixed before the window close, closes, uh, and it will take us a little bit to get those errors. So please let me know. We'll get it fixed for you. And here are our resources. The core code list, that's the page that lists all the core codes for Acadians, RISE, um, benchmarks. They're all on that page. And the student rostering manual has all the, uh, the tiebreakers. It has all the criteria that will get a student rostered for any assessment that we roster. It's a great, it's a great resource. Please share it with your friends. Give it to anyone who you think might, might be interested. It answers a lot of questions. And as always, I answer a lot of questions too. So you can go ahead, get in contact with me if you have any sort of rostering questions. I'm gonna stand so that I don't have to turn around. Okay, so accommodations, go ahead. Um, just your reminder, accommodated participation code, I'm still getting quite a few calls um, and emails about which accommodations are considered standard administration versus accommodated. So just a reminder, um, a really great place is to go directly to those TAMs, like those TAMs for RISE and UA Plus have the charts. If it's in the accommodated chart, a student using those things need to get tagged accommodated. Otherwise, anything else that may be in an IEP uh, alternate location, minimize distractions, right? It's still good to know that, provide that to the students. That's their fate, but it's now standard administration. The other thing to remember is that the page numbers on the TAMs may be incorrect. So oh. you know, remember. Because oh, I might not have updated those. Times since the slide was done. Okay. So well, you can. Numbers could pivot. If you click on the TAM and type in and control F accommodations, it's going to take you right to the chart. Right. It's also in the indexes too. You can go, you can scroll down and there'll be the accommodations and you can click on it. Thanks, Kim. I forgot about that. Um, okay. I'll need to make sure I update that. Okay. So 
I am actually going to try to get some feedback from you guys. Um, this is the first year that we had these RISE uh, request forms for Scribe or assistive technology in the system in Tide. Um, I'll be honest, it's not making my life any easier. <laughs> so that was the idea behind this. Um, so I've got, you know, some feedback for myself on what to do. But interestingly enough, so we did have an LEA that um, right now we don't have it locked down. So any, so a teacher can go in and submit a request form. I do know that some of you guys out there like to have that filter through you. Um, so our question is, should we remove the teacher level to submit request forms um, and, and designate that to be at a building level or district level? And the reason why we are asking is we had a teacher that went ahead and submitted some accommodation request forms that the district then turned around and I approved it, right? Because she said it was in the IEP, right? signed it by her submitting that, that's her signing off, right? That it's in the IEP, they're using it instructionally, um, you know, so so that falls on that teacher. But what happened is the district saw that come through and uh, realized that those accommodations were not in the student's IEP. Um, so kind of wondering how that came through. So that made us start to think, is that a level of access that maybe we should remove? Um, so I think, Kim, on the next slide is a poll. So if you guys can take a minute and um, go ahead and, and do that poll and kind of give me some feedback on what you want to do with that. That has already started blowing. Oh, OK. Well, let me walk over here. So, but still fill out the poll. Fill yeah, out. please fill out, fill out the poll. You have three minutes. So those of you who aren't logged into Nearpod, you have three, you have enough time to log in and then fill it out. So so hey Brooke, really quickly. So no teachers who determine the accommodations in the IE, IEP should. So no teachers who I think she's saying no, 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 no. teachers. Oh, oh. Determine was like, no teachers who I was like, wait a second. Okay. Yeah. Sounds like there's a lot of, yeah. You get the results. There may be arguments for. Um, for the two different positions. And, you know, I mean, just kind of talking. Carolyn talk. just said. I'll talk with that. Um, Carolyn just said, if you can't remove it, can you make it so that ADs have to approve it before it goes to you? Or somebody, a designated person, right? Because I know um, I, that's a good question. You know, these are all things that we could take back to, to CAI. I'm kind of wondering, could we like have the LEA determine a level two? Like, is that even possible? Well, if we could do it similar to what happens with um, test appeals. It could be, you know, like a test appeal where they can fill out the form and then they can click in and do that. It's going to require an enhancement by CAI. It doesn't happen now. Right. But we need to know now because we could change that. We can change the access as soon as possible. They can go in and, and remove from the hierarchy the rule who gets access now mm -hmm. because we still have a good six weeks. Well, about what, 29 days of school left or whatever. We still have some time. But that's the reason why we're asking this question. There's about a minute left in the poll for those of you who are still trying to decide. And we know that you might want to talk to somebody about this. Some of you, you know, but we would still like to see the, the big response. And then, um, like, like Darren said, when we're done, I, I will share the re, uh, the responses in, as soon as we're done. But if I hit share now, you can't answer. So I'm just waiting for the timer to go off and then I'll share so you can see the results. You know, and thinking previously, right, so when we were just emailing in those request forms, right, like what we we're still doing with UA+, Plus, I mean, a teacher could send those in. There were certain districts that I knew, for example, Sherry, I know that you like to be the gatekeeper of that. So I tried my best to help gatekeep that. Um, so this, I guess, is a better way to um, do that, gatekeep that. Alpine says we are going to have the school admin level person enter this. That would be too much work. At the district level. 
uh, to manage all 93. Right. So, I mean, I think being able to, I, th I think the key for us would be just removing that teacher level and then you determine who you designate from there, right? Like the levels that can do that. Well, your results are on the screen. Oh, my results are on the screen. Thank you. <laughs> I was thinking. LA High School Band. So if we just took away teacher access then and then left every other, right, that hierarchy, left it at the school or up, then you guys can make that determination from there. Would that be helpful? Just getting rid of teacher. Oh, okay. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, the whole line, oh, yes. is coming to what you just said. So just said, just get rid of teacher. And then from there, you guys set your policy to determine who submits from there. Okay. Well, all right, that helps. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, DLM. Let's see. What do we have for reminders for DLM? Uh, special circumstance codes. Um, so remember, those are only allowed to be set by the DTC in the system. So whoever you guys have designated for that, um, your reminder that teachers have to submit that first contact survey because that is what delivers the first testlet. And then the special circumstance code gets entered underneath that test management tab directly into um, those subjects. And uh, a quick reminder on the screen here. So when you enter the special circumstance code, you have to hit the little save button next to it, not just the blue button down on the bottom. Um, I was helping somebody do that the other day. So just a reminder how special circumstance codes work for DLM. I think there's one more slide maybe. Um, and don't forget there's that TA document in the DLM district test coordinator Padlet that I have. So there's the link to that again. So there's the TA document on that. Uh, field tests. So reminder, we do participate in field tests um, for DLM. It will be the very last testlet that delivers in the system. So they um, have the students and teachers get through all the operational testlets first, and then it delivers down after that. Your teachers will know that it's the field test because the testing progress window will have an NA in it, and you'll see an FT in that test session name. So remind your teachers. It is optional. So if your teachers have those kiddos that it has taken everything they've had to get through operational testing, thank you very much. Have a nice day. We are not here to punish students or teachers. Just don't do it. But we do need the information. So if you've got kiddos and teachers that can complete that last testlet, please do. Um, and then also is the teacher survey. So that is optional as well. It is on there. Your teachers will see that. They should have one survey per student. Please get through all of your testing first before your teachers fill that out. Um, have them come in and do that later. It is their opportunity to give direct feedback to DLM, how the testlets worked in comparison to what they're doing instructionally, um, and have that kind of direct feedback. And again, like always, DLM does look at every single piece of feedback that comes through. So just a reminder on those. Um, as of whenever I did my slides last week, um, we still had... Uh, a uh, little over 300 kids not rostered. So that's still a good chunk of kiddos in DLM. I'm hoping that has gone down. Um, if you are curious which kiddos are still not rostered, here's kind of some instructions and some screenshots that walk you through. You can pull that rostering, um, student roster and first contact survey status out of the data asterisks in there. So you can look at those screens and, and filter and see who has not been rostered yet um, in your district. Um, if you're curious where you're standing with tests completed, and I know this number has gone up, but again, these were numbers that I pulled as of last week. Um, I think, I don't know, Sid, Kim, help remind me, DLM pulled, I think we were over a thousand students. It was. It was like 1,500 students total. So I guess if you combine all those. The number that popped into my head was 1,500. 1,500. DLM runs it every week for us on our DLM calls. But um, but anyway, as of last week. So again, you can go in and and check that progress as well with what's going on in your district. Um, again, it's another data extract that comes down and then you can just kind of filter um, within those uh, end of your testlets. There's a field that tells you how many have been completed and then next to that, I think it's next to it, it tells you how many are required. So you can kind of see where your, your kiddos are within that extract. One testlet and they're considered a participant. So remember that 
one Tesla, they're considered a participant. It will deliver down a score report. Um, a lot of Teslas have three questions. So the score report is not going to be accurate in determining proficiency off of three questions, but just note that will happen. So at one Tesla, they count as a participant. Um, just some more slides on how you can help read that data extract there on how you can do some filtering. I think that was all I had off the top of my head. Any questions, anything I'm missing that you're thinking about? Um, I have had a lot of accommodation requests come down in Titan the last couple of days or the last couple of weeks. So we've been out monitoring. So be patient. I'm trying to get to them as quickly as possible. Um, so apologies if, if I haven't gotten it to as, as fast as you need, um, but I am trying to work through those as, as quickly as possible. I don't know. Hey, thanks. All right, Wida should be pretty short and sweet. Um, Access testing is done. Yay. Um, and we had right now our preliminary counts are um, somewhere close to about 60,000 students. So the highest ever in Utah, which is fantastic. Um, if you still have not returned your materials, they are definitely late, which is going to delay your materials. But um, one slide back. You will notice that next Friday, um, you will be getting your reports online. So you can access those next Friday in WIDA AMS. And then you should expect your reports, your printed reports, so you don't need to print them, um, to be shipped by the 15th. And then one thing that we do ask is as you're receiving your reports, while you did complete your own uh, data validation, you know, sometimes errors still are there and exist that we didn't catch the first time. If you find any errors, please send those to Marine as soon as possible in a secure manner. Um, Marine, put you on the spot. Um, I know she has some preferences if it's just a couple students versus a lot of students that have errors. How would you like those to be sent to you securely? I think just a couple students, you can encrypt an email and send them to me. I, that's fine. If it's a large number, you can uh, put it in Move It. I'm most people have a Move It account, so that would be great. Yep. And yep, how the 28th in WIDA AMS, you will be able to access reports. Just remember if anything is being returned um, late, those uh, those scores will not be there. And yes, we have been really moving the timeline um, up so we can get things sooner and faster um, and into the data gateway as fast as possible for schools. Um, so as a reminder, the uh, Alternate field test, it is over and the shipping was uh, due yesterday. So friendly reminder, if you didn't meet that deadline, please get those in the mail or I guess with UPS ASAP. Um, and then <laughs> how you're cracking me up <laughs> in the chat. Um, I'll, I'll hassle ACT for you. I'll jump on a call with Scott if you want. Um, so <laughs> good luck with that. <laughs> we'll just invoke <laughs> Megan Law. <It'll> happen. <laughs> um, so uh, do be aware that the access alternate field test, you will not be getting score reports for those students. Um, and the, the big reason why is because those score reports, they have to go through a standard setting and all the things. So um, our only reminder here is get those materials returned so we can finish the process, have an alternate screener and an updated alternate access as soon as possible. And then the last thing that we do need to discuss, oh, and I apologize, this slide did not translate over well, but... Um, over the summer, 
Theta AMS is going to be going over a huge, it's going under a huge overhaul. So there will be a lot of enhancements and upgrades happening to WIDA AMS pertaining to access testing. And because of all of these changes, that means all trainings related to access testing have to be updated as well. Um, so no access trainings, online access trainings that you can um saying access a lot, that you can access, <laughs> access, access in the secure portal, those trainings will not be available over the summer from June 30th to August 31st. Um, I suggest even now, do not do any access test administration trainings um, in the secure portal because it's all going to change this summer. Um, you will need to wait till September 1st to start doing any access trainings. Now that all being said is um, screener. All of those trainings are still going to be available. AMS is not going to be changing anything for screener right now. So you will have all of your trainings that you can still do for screener right now, over the summer, um, that, that will all still be available. So, um, plan on screening, screener trainings and everything this summer screener is going to be available in AMS all summer. So that will not change. Okay. It's just access. We're just talking access. So if your LEA has historically done trainings for access in the summer, you will need to wait till September 1st to do those trainings again. And then of course, um, the state, we will also offer some um, virtual webinars with DRC as well. Um, and we will make sure that we heavily, heavily communicate um, all the changes. Vita and DRC will be making sure they communicate all the changes you can expect to see in AMS. So um, I did see a lot of, uh, or a few comments about screener. Again, screener is not being affected. So as this rolls out more, we'll keep updating you on those timelines. And as always, please contact us, your friendly neighborhood WIDA specialists. Hey, just a reminder for the keep and peep. Um, we're rolling up on that end of the year date. So that last four weeks of school and all kindergarten students and those preschool students who are they're participating in those programs. And then just making sure your data, data is entered into the data gateway by June 15th. And then if you do need materials, um, they can be picked up here at our USBE offices or um, so email me if you need those materials. And then just a reminder that there is additional guidance around the KEEP assessment for the writing question. So I put that out there a few um, months ago, but just wanted to remind you that as your teachers are scoring those writing questions um, within the KEEP assessment, that there is additional examples and guidance around that that will probably help clear up um, maybe some questions they have about how to score that student writing. So that is available on the KEEP page under our assessment website. That's it. All right. Teresa could have kept going, but thought I could get up and move. I, sh I shared it. <laughs> yeah. So um, we share this every meeting just as an update. So you have the information there as far as the testing window at the end of the year, and then some examples of parent letters. So this is uh, Teresa's area. If you have questions, uh, we can respond, but um, progress monitoring for the summer. Do you have more to say about that one? 
Okay. Just information. Information. Bob, Bob thanks. Okay. There you go. Uh, and then as far as vendor applications for the next year, um, you can see the dates there. So May 1st uh, through May 31st is when you're going to be looking for the survey to be sent out to you and then for you to gather a response and send that back. Uh, the way we're doing it is similar to last year. So really the Acadians reading selection is what drives the Acadians mass selection. So if you're selecting ALO for reading, then we're going to ask you, okay, do you want ALO or ADM for math? If you're selecting Amplify or ADM for reading, then um, we as a default just go to ADM for math. Uh, and, and the reason there is just to keep things more simple. Um, if you're already using uh, a different, like the same platform for ALO, it makes sense maybe to have ALO for math. Um, but if you're using a different one for Amplify or ADM, um, and then try to do ALO for math, it, it's just um, you're having a lot of more complexity there and we're trying to avoid that if you do have questions and and you have some reasons why you're thinking um you want to go that route um you can contact us um, via email. um hal said can you copy the curriculum directors on this email yeah definitely we can do that and we typically um, include literacy directors on the vendor selection. So we send out the email to assessment directors and literacy directors and ask you to communicate with your partners in your LEA so that we only receive one application back per LEA. Um, but sometimes the literacy director fills it out. Sometimes it's the assessment director. We can include curriculum directors too, if that would be helpful. Sorry. On, on that last one, um, on the vendor selection as well, Jared mentioned that um, ALO for math is only available if you're also an ALO reading um, vendor participant. Just one other reminder on that. Um, they, um, Acadians was allowing us this year to demo the um, digital entry for ALO math. Um, this next year, that's a cost. We're looking at adjusting our contract and seeing if we could do a contract amendment. But at this point, um, we don't have that available for next year, the digital data entry for ALO. Um, so if that's something that you were looking for as a decision to change vendors for next year, please reach out to us and we can discuss that. But at this point, we've not made any contract amendments to include, include the digital data entry for ALO for math. So at this point, you can see Jared mentioned on here, it's only a manual entry for ALO for math at this point. And then I think you have the next slide if yes. you wanna keep going. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, and Darren mentioned, um, mentioned this previously, but we are about to um, move forward with the RFP for <laughs> Um, our Acadians reading vendor. So it says math up there, but that's that's incorrect as of right now. We're moving forward with just an RFP for Acadians reading. Um, our contract currently goes through June of 24 for all of our reading vendors. Uh, this summer, we'll be posting that new benchmark reading RFP. And um, We'll likely have a vendor well before our contract ends in June of 24. Our math um, RFP and our current math contract goes through June of 26, like Darren mentioned. So at this point, there's um, not, we're not combining anything with reading and math at this point. We'll see if we can change legislation and change our funding streams to combine those two funding streams. Um, but at this point, the, the vendor um, selection will just be for the reading vendor for our RFP. But we still have one more year. So we're getting a couple of questions about people hearing that M class is going away or that ADM is going away. We have locked in because we have a state level contract. We have locked in these vendors will be our state vendors or options through um, this next school year, the 23-24 school year. So if you have questions about that, feel free to reach out to Teresa or myself. There are two in the chat. Okay. Try to say it loud. Can you explain? Um 
Well, uh, ALO, I'm new. So oh, yeah. Fun. Okay. So ALO stands for Acadians Learning Online. They're a vendor that um, delivers the Acadians Reading Assessment, and it's just an online platform. So similar to the Amplify M-Class platform, it's similar to that, but just a different vendor. But all of these vendors provide the same assessment. Um, it's just a different way of entering the data and different reports that people get. Second question has to do with uh, what the requirements regarding scoring and online features are. Yeah, that's a good question about scoring and the online features. So our RFP is, um, it does require that we have a digital component. It's what's legislated. So if we look at the legislation around the benchmark reading assessment, a lot of that information is what's included in our RFP. Um, so the scoring there's not necessarily a section on scoring, how we score the assessment, but we do have legislation that um, there is a digital component to the assessment. So that's included in the language of the RFP. There's something else besides scoring. Was there a second part of the what was in there? Online features. Scoring. Oh, the online features. So for Acadians reading, yeah, there is that that there's a digital component. Um, so that language is there. And remember, this is specifically for the reading assessment, um, not the math assessment does not include the language about that requirement to be digital. Um, by the time we post the RFP for the math um, contract, I don't know if that will have changed or not, but at this point, there's not a requirement in math that there's a digital component. But reading there is. So this is, we're moving forward with the reading RFP for new reading vendors or a new contract, not necessarily new vendors, but a new contract, um, and there is a digital component there. I just, uh, I would just add in my personal narrative on the fact that the math doesn't have a requirement for digital. That doesn't mean that we wouldn't, that uh, available funding could support it. Right. Yeah. We, we, we've heard uh, lots of discussion from our assessment directors Uh, Acadian's math is something. Yes, yeah, loudly. And and something that we've passed on that um, request for the Acadian's math digital components to the vendor. Our vendor has been pretty responsive in, in incorporating that. And like I said, they were allowing us um, at no cost to us to use that digital component in their system in ALO this year. Um, it would just it just requires us to move forward with the contract amendment and different funding structures if we were to use that for the future. But that would likely be something that we would push for if we had the funding for in a, um, when that contract is up, when we move forward with the new contract for Acadians Math. Mark, one more question. Is this an RFP for an early literacy assessment or an assessment specific, specific to the Acadians reading Dibbles types of measures? Yeah, so the legislation just calls it the benchmark reading. So our code says benchmark reading assessment. Right now in board rule, it does say Acadians reading, but board rule is, is driven by code. So our RFP is for a benchmark reading assessment. Um, there are specific components of that that it has to have. It has to have a Lexile. It has to be able to report a Lexile score. It has to be able to report a growth score because it attaches to the um, early learning plans and we require a growth score for that. So we have some... Um, specific requirements that we have, but not necessarily a specific assessment that we're requiring. So board rule says Acadians reading, but code only says a benchmark reading. So we're going off of what the code requires and then we'll adjust board rule if we need to. And, and then the other thing with this is um, there is a link to Acadians vendor information. So if you're wondering about ALO, ADM, Click on that link and take it. We just didn't want all the slides included here. Also, I might add the ALO is, is rostered entirely differently from, from ADM and Amplify. So that might be something to look at too. Yeah, and that's so for this year, that is something their Ross ALO rosters differently. We're actually working on a contract amendment with our vendor to make that automated rostering from our level of the state. Our timeline is going to be tight. We're hoping that we can get that by the beginning of the year, but hopefully that won't be an issue um, starting in the fall of 23. Okay, and then um, there's our contact information, Teresa and myself. The other thing I didn't include in the slide that I just wanted to share. Um, 
It, it actually really came from me trying to organize Acadian's math stuff in my own head and know where all the different locations are of the resources. So I've created, um, I, I took a, I stole something like I did as a teacher, you know, from a colleague. So I, I took the idea of a Padlet um, from Tracy and created an Acadian's math Padlet that I'll put in the chat, uh, a link to there. Um, but it's just where I'm keeping Acadian's math resources. So if you, if you want to use it, great. If you also have suggestions of things that would be helpful to have there for you to access, um, please share that with me. Yeah. Uh, maybe this is a safe question. Um, is it possible for LEAs to purchase these? I'll, uh, I'll, I'll let's yeah. see. <laughs> so that's, that's a great question. I'm unsure on the first or third grade if, if you would be able to purchase that um, for just that section. Um, we'd have to talk with our vendor about that. If, if you purchase fourth through sixth grade licenses, that's outside of our Utah contract. So you'd be able to do whatever you want with fourth through sixth grade. I'm not sure how that works with first through third grade. Um, if you'd be able to purchase that separately or not. Um, let, let us look into that. Have we, uh, since we're between, uh, there's two comments about keep. The first one is, will there be any... Yes. I do not have dates set. Then... Um, this one just, uh, there was talk about replacing keep now. Um, the board has not made a decision about that. I believe, I believe it comes up in August um, for them to make that final decision about what they want to do around the kindergarten assessment. So in board meeting in August, they'll be making that decision. Yeah, and the time the timing of that we recognize the timing of that for an LEA isn't very helpful. Uh, so we would advocate to the board as they make their decision to make the following go into effect if they make a determination. The kindergarten required test that they would um, that they would allow that to happen the following year. So for next year, the keep is still required. And then the board will be making a decision for the 24-25 school year as to whether it's keep or Acadians or whether they're just leaving it the way it is. Sorry, the sound wasn't wasn't really cutting out. Darren was just talking quietly. I'm very sorry. <laughs> Everybody's like, the sound's cutting out. <laughs> it's fine, it's fine. Sorry, actually, actually, the sound was cutting out, so I couldn't hear the response about the keep training. Oh, yes, there will be a keep training this summer. Um, I will send out that information as far as what dates are that will be. <coughs> I know we have a lot of new kindergarten teachers with the um, increase in old AK, so definitely want to support you with that. To talk to the mic. Well, <laughs> <laughs> the mic, if the mic's in front of her, yeah, it works better to speak into it than behind. That one works. I could hear you fine. Yeah. It was Darren that I couldn't hear. And where can we go ahead and take a, a, a what did you say, 10 minute break, Darren? Well, 10 uh, 1030. 1030. Can I ask a quick question really quick and just answer in the chat as you go on to break? Speaking of Padlets, Jessica and I have been toying with creating an accommodations Padlet to kind of quicker access things. Will you just throw in the chat if you would find that helpful? Thanks, that's all. So for RISE, just a reminder, um, we've had a lot of questions about RISE writing and how it is created. As a reminder, we went to a rubric-based scoring system, and I've outlined that rubric here for you. Okay, again, this is only for grades five and eight, and you are looking at one to four points for the statement of purpose and focus and organization, one to four points with evidence and elaboration, and then one to two points for conventions. Zero okay. to two. Zero to two. 
zero to two, typo, zero to two. Okay, go ahead and go to the next slide. So I would recommend if you have some questions regarding your writing scores um, to look at the RISE reporting guide. It starts on page 153 and you can review how to access the ISRs because you have to access the ISR to see the breakdown of those points, okay? And then I also included a link to the RISE writing rubrics that are also found in the portal that are helpful um, to kind of just look, a lot, look at alongside your ISRs. One little tip, if you have teachers complaining and they see scores that are like two out of 10, the number one thing to do is have them make sure they download the ISR because if they get a score of two out of 10, they their uh, response triggered a condition code um, and it's already been reviewed. So there's nothing left to review. It usually means they've either copied too much of the, the text into the into their response or they have um, uh, used duplicate text, duplicate text that where they've just repeated the same phrase over and over and over. And they, there's also the one for if they've typed in like not if they type in a language other than English, it will trigger a condition code or, off topic or a completely off topic. So if they see if you if somebody reaches out to you or you're looking at your data and you see two out of 10, the only as far as we've been able to figure out, we've never seen a score that was two out of 10 that was not because of the condition <laughs> code was triggered. But the only way you can see that is you actually have to look at the ISR to see what it is. So. And uh, Amanda, in answer to your question that's there in the chat, we don't assign a proficiency with writing. It's just the rubric score. Yeah, Christine. Is it, it's computer graded and hand graded? Is that what I understand that there's some are randomly pulled? So the first 500 are hand scored. After that, they are computer. Is that about right, Sid? Yes. Yes. But okay. they get a or a condition code. A condition code, and that's why if they get two out of ten, they've already been hand scored. So, so there, yes, the first five hundred are always going to be hand scored. But then there are instances when, um, if a condition code is triggered, they will double check, have a human double check, um, or if um, the system like. And, and I can't explain the, the technology and the AI behind it all, but um, there are times when the system will want a human to verify the scoring as well. So um, any year, it's a different amount that goes to human scoring. But you, um, if you do not get um, the score back pretty immediately, normally that's going to be your indication that it did go to human scoring and their timeline that they gave us in the past has been five business days. I've never been able to figure out when that first business day actually starts, depending when on they, when the test when was submitted. submitted. It's when, it's when they so, you know, and, and different states have different holidays and all the good things. So that those five business days. And then um, we're seeing a lot of questions about, you know, what's a passing score. There's no way, again, we can't assign proficiency. We can't assign a passing score to this because it's based on a rubric, right? And that way that you get that score, if the student got an eight out of 10, um, it could have came in so many different combinations based on that rubric. They could have gotten a four in two of the categories and a zero in the other. That does not mean they're proficient in all aspects of writing, right? So it really is dependent on going in, as Elise said, looking at the ISR and the rubrics that we provide and say, okay, the student scored a two in this category. What does that mean according to the rubric? And what are the implications for the student and their writing ability in just that category? And right? just for that writing and, and just for that writing experience. Yes. Because the reason why proficiency scores aren't provided for one writing um, experience is because to, to, to say that a student is a proficient writer in third grade because they answered, wrote a two paragraph response to an informational prompt is not necessarily valid or reliable. So it's one piece of evidence. Remember, we always encourage everyone to look at multiple forms of evidence 
and it's part of that conversation. So, and I know as, as a writing <coughs> specialist teacher, that is, you know, it makes you really anxious, but you also, if you've been um, doing writing throughout the whole school year with those students, you should be able to look and say, yep, that's about where I thought they would be based on X, Y, and Z, mm -hmm. which is why we so strongly encourage you to use Utah Compose, use the writing benchmarks, use um, your own classroom writing, have your students be involved in writing and using setting goals and using rubric-based scoring with your students as well and providing feedback that they can act on, not just giving everybody a grade and a check mark, so. Yes, and uh, um, also um, we still, I even got one this morning, get questions about, well, how many paragraphs do these need to be? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, in five paragraph essay format for informational yeah, prompts. Yeah, um, there is no, like the informational prompts will say two to three. They can write more than two to three. You know, they might have one really amazing paragraph. It really depends on what is the writing prompt? What is the task asking the student to do and the student responding to that task appropriately? And there is no set length for informative or argumentative. It is, am I responding and being thorough in my response? And there are so many different text types um, and purposes for writing that, you know, it, there's no, it just depends, you know, it just depends on what you're being asked to do. So there's never, we will never tell you, you have to write this many paragraphs. And the system is not going to grade them on length. You will notice that it does not say anywhere in the rubrics, they did two or three paragraphs, or they did five, or they did six paragraphs. The, length, the, the AI is not going to judge you on the length. The only time it's going to judge you on the length is if you only write, I want to say, is it 11, 11 or fewer, is it characters or words? Now I get words, it. I think. 11 or fewer words, that's not enough for the engine to actually grade. So if you have 11 or fewer words, then you're going to have a, a score of two for not enough text or not enough insufficient, I think it will say. Insufficient to score. Insufficient response. Thank you. Yep. There's a question online. Remind me, do we have to enter an accommodation code if Spanish trans adaptive is selected? <laughs> we have we have talked about this, have we not? What Tracy? What? <laughs> somebody else was accommodated. So here's yeah, because it's an accommodation. So it falls within. Yeah. An accommodation. So it does need to be coded 201, please, um, because that's the directive that we've given you guys, right? If it's in an accommodated list, then that's, it needs to be coded 201. And technically it is, right? It's an accommodation that we're providing to students who are English learners. Um, it's not required, right? This is not a required thing that you have to do. It is an available accommodation to those students who are eligible for it, if appropriate. Does that help? Yes. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, this slide is just a quick reference for you as you are, we're, we're kind of in the dead middle of RISE testing, but as you get to the end for your end of testing guidance, just know that all cleanup for RISE needs to be done by close of business on June 14th. And basically the last like 27 or so pages of the RISE Tide user guide is going to be your best friend. I've outlined the pages here for you, um, but again, we notice because we make some updates in the middle, hey, these might shift, but currently this is what they are. I we have an update. Okay, yes, time we have not updated. Um, so we're gonna look at managing appeals requests first as you're probably seeing these come in. When you see these come in, they're gonna be in that green center section with the administering tests. Now, before we move forward, I also want you to pay very close attention to the blue column that says after testing, because I neglected to create a slide that had that blue column. So put that in the back of your brain and we're gonna reference that 
visually in your minds in just a little bit. <laughs> and not everyone gets has will see the blue screen. Yes, you have only to have LEA level user to yes, see the blue screen. Only LEA levels will see that. So with your test appeals, there's two steps that have to be completed. So after you create the appeal or the teacher creates the appeal, the assessment director needs to go in and process the appeal. And when you process it, you have the option to approve that or to deny that. And that is your decision. If you need some guidance, feel free to reach out. But really, for the most part, when you see the comments that are entered by whomever created the appeal, you can generally use your best judgment there on whether you're choosing to approve that um, appeals request or deny the appeals request. For data cleanup and discrepancy resolution, this is where I said you're going to need to activate a little bit of prior knowledge here because step one isn't showing. Step one is to click in that blue after testing cleanup. So just, just a heads up there. That is step one. Step two, you're going to fill out all of the required fields that show up on that discrepancy resolution report. Okay. And it's going to show you uh, any test opportunity that has any discrepancy, which basically means any outstanding opportunity that's uh, currently eligible for a summative test who hasn't started. Okay. So that's what this is going to show you. Then you will click the little tools icon. You can then resolve that discrepancy. Okay. The resolve discrepancy page is going to then pop up. And you can select the pencil icon to edit it or to enter the participation code. Um, there's also a drop down menu that will uh, give you the choices of the non participation codes to enter. And you just choose the ones as applicable and select save. And then it will allow you to continue to move through your resolutions from there. Um, the one enhancement now that we have that is new that we went through the training, but I wanted you to, again, be aware of it now, is the bulk upload for non-participation codes so that hopefully this streamlines the process a little bit for you. So starting here in spring, all you need to do is enter um, the SSIDs and their corresponding participation codes into the appropriate Excel CSV file that you can download. And then you can then upload that through the system. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. So much rejoicing over this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're very excited about it. Okay, so you'll upload your file with the SSIDs and the, cor and the corresponding non-participation codes. Um, if you have if you have not saved the template on your device, you'll just need to download it and you can then make those changes. Once you do that, you upload it, you can select next. And then you will be asked to preview the file. Question, Emily? Yes. Uh, when should the discrepancy resolution link be active? Mine is currently not a live link. They take it probably won't be well check with CAI, but it usually is about a month before the window closes. So probably it may. probably about the time that Utah Spire Plus goes offline around May 12th, I would expect it. But we'll double check with Eric. But you have about a month. And remember, not everyone has access to this. So if that was an AD, then they should have access. Okay, but it takes a little bit of time. It doesn't happen for a while because I want to get testing out of the way before everybody starts doing this. Because you do this at the end not in the middle of testing. So after you preview your file, it is actually going to then show you any errors when you have uploaded. So any errors in the file are going to be flagged in this little validation step, and you're going to need to fix them before it will um, upload appropriately, okay? So just kind of be aware of that. You just put it in. Okay, perfect. <laughs> and then this process is outlined in the Rise Tide User Guide, page 145. So those of you who are super excited for this, can you can go and do some reading. <laughs> It'll be so much fun for you. The, this is the contact information for the Rise Help Desk. Um, as a reminder, for uh, when the summative window is open, 
The help desk is available through 7 p.m. This does not mean that testing is available through 7 p.m. It means the help desk is available through 7 p.m., okay? Um, and just also with any of our help desk um, contacts, whether it be with RISE or with Pearson, um, please use the email or the phone number that's provided on the contact sheet. If someone from RISE or Pearson has reached out to you directly regarding another communication, um, don't reply to that email. We want to try to keep things in uh, the appropriate chain of command. If there are any issues, though, again, don't hesitate to contact me as well, and I'm happy to reach out on behalf of you to the appropriate personnel. Emily? Um, hang on. I have to scroll back up and find it. Um, would you briefly review last month's discussion about USBE reviewing ELL first year in the U.S. codes versus entering them manually at local Yes. Go We're good. Because <laughs> I was like, I don't recall this conversation. <laughs> and I wasn't at last month's meeting, but I think I understand the question. Um, so the question is, uh, do you need to enter code 103, 104, and 204 for um, first year ELs and second year ELs? What I've been told by data and statistics is that if your SIS system is up to date and you have an accurate entry date for the student, they can check for how long the student has been enrolled in, in the school and appropriately apply the rule for first year, second year, um, enrolled after April 15th exemption, et cetera. Um, but the SIS system must be accurate for that to happen. Um, if you are not confident that your SIS system is accurate, I would recommend strongly that you enter the EL codes manually. And to review those um, just for fun, uh, code 103 is for students who enroll after April 15th and are exempt. Code 104 is for students who enrolled at any other point during this school year, and this is their first year in the state of Utah. Code 204 is for students who enrolled last year, and this is their second year in the state of Utah. And they are e learners. <laughs> I ask a quick question on that. If you have a, a student that's taking a test that just sits there and stares at it, they, they don't speak any English, they're just, right. Does those, what happens to the code there? Are we supposed to add something or does that automatically populate if the test has not been taken? Megan, can you add to that? I, my, I think. Are we still talking about RISE or Utah Spire Plus? RISE. RISE. Um, so, I mean, Obviously, when the student enrolls, that's going to, you know, as an EL, that's going to be one thing. But if a student, I mean, and I, I think, obviously, I, I'm going to defer to Kim on this, but my inclination would be if they're not interacting with the test, that's a decline testing or a refuse to test. A, a refusal. A refusal to test. Not because they're trying to be bad or there's right. like behavioral issues, but... If they're not testing, they're not testing. That's a refuse to test. And, and I would just, that's one of those things where you kind of have to use some judgment with your testing coordinator at your school and stuff. But if a kid's been sitting there through the entire session, it's just fine. <laughs> yeah. You know, and if a kid that's crying yeah. and is don't just, do that. Don't, that do point, that. don't make you do that. that. We are not here to torture children, right. everyone. I mean, use some, use some guidance. If you, if it was your own child sitting in front of that computer, what would you do? And that's what I always tell people. Like so, if you're, you know, you've got to kind of think, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've had those conversations. So if they do not test, so they sign in, they get them signed in, and they just stare, we are supposed to put refuse to test. Yeah, we're not, we're not supposed to let the EL thing populate. Is that what my understanding? Uh, yes, that if, if you decide to discontinue the testing session, do enter the code 106. It will override the EL code. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Hey, I, I'm going to just interrupt Elise really quickly because she's about to talk about Utah Spire Plus. Brooke and Adam have both reported in the chat that Utah Spire Plus is having some issues. Can you tell us what's happening? Because we haven't seen anything come through yet. 
um, what exactly would you say issues are happening? And you please come off chat rather than typing it in the, in the, I mean, please come off mute and just sit, tell us. Okay, oh, we just is, got, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Brooke. Go ahead, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> we just got reports from both of our high schools that the student experience is, has just kind of gone offline. Uh, we're double checking our network status right now just to confirm and trying to get in touch with Pearson support. Uh, Proctor's admins are still able to access the Aspire Plus system on the admin side of things, but uh, no testing is taking place in Ogden right now. Okay. Uh, Elise is going to cover her. I think she has, what, three slides? Yeah. And then she will just call few. right now. She'll call Tyler and ask for tier two. She'll call Tyler right now. Just give her two seconds to finish her slides. And then it'll be Scott's turn. So she'll reach out right now. So thank you. We have heard that the help desk is extremely slow today already, like 45 minute wait time. So we'll, we'll find out what's going on. So go ahead, my friend. Okay. So just as a reminder with Utah Aspire Plus, if students are transferring schools mid session now with testing, which doesn't happen a lot, but we do still see it. Remember that there is the manual transfer request option that when you log into Pearson Access Next, you will need to check your notifications by clicking on that little bell. Um, I think I have 17 that are sitting currently pending, which means that 17 of you need to check them. <laughs> so click on the little bell. It doesn't like have a drop down like on your iPhone where the little thing's gonna have like a number by it. You have to click on the bell to view the notification. So check those. Um, because there are schools who are just waiting for you to approve that so that they can test the student and you don't have to, right? With Utah Aspire Plus, the window closes May 12th. All of the um, post-test activities um, guidance is included in the TAM on pages 152 through 163. And data cleanup needs to be completed before your close of school day on May 19th. Uh, that's also included in the schedule of events. So if you haven't checked that in a little while, you might want to pull that up and see um, what tasks are time sensitive over the next couple of weeks. As far as cleanup post-test activities for Utah Aspire Plus, this is just a high-level overview. When you are all the way finished, you will need to remove students who are in ready status before stopping any of the sessions. The tests that are sitting there waiting will need to be marked complete. You'll then need to ensure that your participation codes are correct. Um, one of the ways that you can verify that is to use the student test update export. Um, and it will show you any of the codes that have been applied in column AQ. Okay. Once that's all done, you can then stop all of your sessions and then return any of the materials if you had um, paper materials, and then obviously destroy your testing tickets, scratch paper, those types of things. For reporting, our on-demand reports are available within 48 hours. So many of you have already reached out and explained that that was a delightful enhancement for you, and we are just as excited as you are. Um, the other reporting is scheduled to be available for you May 26th. This would include the ISRs, the test score data file, and the test events data file. And then I've put more guidance there, can be found in the TAM in like the pages 160 to 170 range. And then the parent portal will be available with the reporting on May 30th. The reason there's a four day delay is just so that if somebody, we see something really just before it goes out to, gets posted in the parent portal, we can stop that before it all. There. And same with the Utah Aspire Help Desk. During our testing window, they extend their help desk hours to 7 p.m. Okay. That the 4 p.m. is for regular Monday through Friday when it's not a testing time. So know that you can contact their help desk um, in the small window of past business hours if needed. ACT updates. Got some. Nice, short, fast ending. Of course, we say the best for last. Yay, ACT. Um, so testing is complete. We have similar numbers uh, compared to last year. Actually, this number's gone up because this was last week. We're up around 42,800 students completed testing. Um, so um, looking really good there. 
There is a survey coming out. It's the same survey that came out last year. You answering that survey helps ACT and us out a lot. So please, when you see that come into your email, please um, have that um, survey answered. Remind your test administrators at your schools to please answer that also because that information from the trenches really helps out a lot. So please respond to that. We'd, that'd be great. There are vouchers coming out. Um, they should have come out. I hope they came out. <laughs> you should have received an email also, um, hopefully. Um, each student that was disrupted during the famous disruption of window one, which is, I think, 580-ish students here in Utah, they will get an email that contains registration codes aligned to their SSID. They'll get information on a free Kaplan course and everything they need to register to take the ACT if they want to take it again as a retake for free. That information allows them to take the test on June 10th or July 15th this summer. If they don't take it, then they're out of luck. They can't do it. It's not possible for them. Test administrators will also receive an email with information and a hotline phone number in case you have questions. That includes school test level administration administrators. The students will actually get a hotline for their own selves. It's a totally different hotline to answer student questions. Um, really important. It's really helpful if you were to call those students down to say the counselor's office and have them sit down and say, hey, do you want to retake the test? Great. Log in now. Let's sign you up to retake the test, especially for your accommodated kids. If kids need to come have had accommodations on this test, they need to specifically request those accommodations when they register. If they don't, they won't be able to have them. And I don't know about your kids, but my kids growing up would have skipped over that and not clicked it if they were the ones responsible to click it. But having a responsible adult to say, no, 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 you get those accommodations, take them, click it. You can decide to not use it in the test if you want. That's a different thing. But make sure they click, they, they want those accommodations so they can get them. Because if they don't, they can't. It's, so that's pretty much it when it comes to the vouchers. Um, Officially, this is official, next year, Pearson Access Next for ACT is dead. It's gone. The way of the dodo bird, it's toast. We're now switching over to something called ACT Now. It's a new product from ACT that we actually got demonstrated um, last month. It's going to replace Pearson Access Next and Pearson Access Next only. And so ACT success will still be there. But Pearson Access Next, in terms of rostering the students, proctoring the test, is going to be now ACT Now. The new system has some nice bonuses. This past year, if you had to change your window or change students or get do some emergency testing in Window 3, you had to contact ACT, you had to get permission, they needed to do all that switching, and you had to wait to get verification that it even happened. Now you can do it yourself. That's We're kind of excited about this because... Literally, say your girls' basketball team makes state, and it happens to be during the window when you're testing, you can pull those individual students out and put them in a totally different window. You don't need to ask permission. You don't need to email me. You don't even have to say, is this okay, on a phone call with me. You can just go ahead and do it. It's all up to you. You can actually switch those windows without any authorization. It's very intuitive in the system. Even Kim liked it, less clicking. <laughs> I mean, Kim's very, very, very awesome when it comes to looking at software programs and she was pretty excited about it too. I like the how-to tutorials that are in here because like, if you can say, well, I got a new student in my school, I should email Scott and ask, how do I roster a new student? No, type in the little how-to button. How do I roster a new student? And it will walk you step-by-step -step in the program as you roster that student, it's pretty cool. I don't think I've ever seen a tutorial program like that. It actually has you do it in the actual system instead of showing you how to do it in some window off to the side. And then you got to replicate it again. It just literally highlights whatever you need to click on. I thought it was pretty neat. So a lot of cool things coming out with this new system. Stay tuned because we're going to be working with ACT to come up with some dates in terms of training to get this all in place. And we're going to want to make sure that not just you, but anyone that you have in your district that helps with proctoring ACT and all of your school level administrators and proctors, we want to make sure that they are able to get access to this and get access to this training and we can get this off as smooth as we want. So that's coming out beginning of this next school year. We're kind of pumped about it.
I've had a lot of phone calls lately. I don't have a slide for this because this is my last one, I think. Um, a lot of phone calls asking about scores. Um, if you test it online, your scores are there. You need to go to successact.org. They're there. I looked. I looked for the state. Um, yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, scores are there. You can look them up in the success system. If you test it on paper during the first couple of windows, your scores are probably there. Um, through the third window, not quite yet, but they're coming. Um, the paper, of course, takes a little bit longer. But we've got scores in there right now. I went and looked for the entire state. I looked at a couple of the LEAs just to see. And just a couple of reminders in success. For some weird reason, it defaults to a fall administration. We did not administer in the fall. So if you keep it on that default, you're not going to see anything. You got to make sure you click for the spring and make sure you click for the 22-23 school year. Because if you don't, it's going to show your previous year. And so you make sure you click those right little buttons when you're looking through the, through the reporting system and you can look up your scores right now. They're available. And so that's what I got. Any questions? There are a bunch in the chat, I think. Please get them. I like that. And ask them, though, because some people don't look at you. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, for... We'll still be using PA Next for Utah Aspire Plus, right? Just confirming that my high school TCs will need to learn different systems for ACT and Utah Aspire Plus. Yes, that yes. is still true. Though. That is true. <laughs> but there will be no more PA Next. We're going moving to the Adam system, which is also far more intuitive, far less onerous as PA Next, and hopefully we'll all be much happier. Um, the test nav system remains. So the issues people have with test nav is not going away, but PA next issues will be going away. So they will have a different system for Utah Spire Plus and a different system for ACT and a different system for RISE. <laughs> okay. We're becoming very computer literate in Utah when it comes to testing. All right. Um, all right. Next question. Um, I read somewhere that the core benchmarks will move to that is correct, as of in August. All right. uh, next question. Um, when and how do we sign up for testing windows? Um, the same as before, that'll happen actually in the ACT Now system when we get that up and running. The testing windows, I've published those. I, I, for the, I think published the, the windows. Yeah, we already published the windows. I went out, I think, in an AD memo. And they're also a month and a half ago. They're also on this the 2024 assessment director resource guide on the USBE website. The yep. dates, all the test dates have already been published. Dates are for published for those. Um, and as soon as, and if I remember right, it's it's not until later in the system. Everything happens a little bit later with ACT. Um, probably I want to say September, at least maybe in October. That's when you'll be picking the dates. So it's not until the fall. But we'll let you know with plenty of time before then when you pick those dates. And those dates are available already, so you can plan at least. You can, you can set the dates for your LEA. Oh, you, you want. just can't put them in the system yep. for ACT yet. But, yeah. Um, next question. So students will log in online to AN or ADAM and ACT now. Okay. No. If you're talking about what students, students take their tests and tests now. Yeah. yeah. So they the students don't log into into the the PA next, as far as I understand. Elise is trying to handle the Utah Aspire Plus question, so that's why I'm um, crisis right now. So I'm trying to answer for it. Um, students don't log into PA next or my ACT. That is what that is an administrative system function. Students will continue to take their tests and test now. Nothing else. Nothing else. Well, is there any time, anytime there's any questions, please let us know. Always happy to take your questions, um, help you out with anything you need to do. And Darren, I think you get to close this out. Yeah, You're the boss. We have sent an urgent email and tried to call Utah Spider Plus. We are working on what, trying to find out what's going on. Is it just an opt-in? Looks like Ogden and Jordan. Ogden and Jordan were the two that said something in here. Is anyone else, while, while Darren's walking up to the mic, does anybody <laughs> else have, has anyone else heard any issues with Utah Spire Plus today, except for those two districts. Neighbor is now having issues. Okay. It's it's definitely a system. Now we're at three, so there's no question. 
we'll uh, we'll uh, send out information as we get it and uh, try to get the problem resolved as soon as possible. Well, as always, I'd like to conclude our meeting by expressing my gratitude to the assessment and accountability team that I get the privilege of working with here. Thank uh, Emily for managing our um, online uh, meetings as well as she does, and Amy for sending out the AD information. And then also to thank each of you for the, the hard work that you do on behalf of your students and your local communities. Thank you for the relationship that we have um, as staff for the State Board of Education with each of you, um, for the open and honest communications that we're able to have with one another, um, which really, as I start out the meeting, that really facilitates uh, organizations and individuals being able to solve problems quickly and uh, to work well together. So thank you very much and um, have a wonderful day.